Because what two characters are compared throughout Proverbs? Did you guys have a chance to read through Proverbs and, and look at that? Very interesting. <laughs> what I did kind of catch on from it was the simple person and the wise. Mm -hmm. What are some other names that they're called? Were you able to find that out? I, I didn't see any other names that I, that I caught. Okay, that's fine. It's the pool. Uh-huh. The fool and the wise man. You know. The righteous and the uh, and the wicked. Mm -hmm. The sluggard and the and the diligent person. The uh, just this constant contrast. And if you notice, he actually the, he actually kind of uses the terms um, interchangeably. In other words, he calls the wicked person a fool who is a sluggard. Yeah. See what I mean? He uses the terms interchangeably to where you have these two ideal people. The one is an ideal bad person, and the other one is an ideal good person. And the good person is someone who fears the Lord. It's someone who's righteous, someone who works diligently, who's wise in what they do. They, they, they plan, you know, that kind of thing. And then the fool, the wicked person, is someone who's a lazy person, someone who doesn't seek the opportunities, someone who misuses their, their what they have. Um, so you just see these two characters compared throughout the whole book of Proverbs. But uh, very good, very good job catching that. Air high five. Grace, can you hear us? Yeah. Do you want us to stop and wait for you? No, you can. Okay. Uh, last week we talked about the introduction of Proverbs, and we talked about the first three message, three of the thirteen messages um, to youth, which takes place between chapters one and chapter, I want to say nine. Um, the first message was to listen to your parents, found in chapter one, verse eight through nine. The second message was to Say no to bad things, <laughs> chapter 1, 10 through, verse 10, 10 through 19. And the third message was don't reject wisdom, chapter 1, verse 20 through 33. Which, which brings us to the fourth message. So if you're following along, it will be in Proverbs chapter 2. You guys talked about all that last week? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's online. Do you, want me to, do you want me to share it onto your Facebook? Or message it to you. Crazy, didn't you share that? Yeah. Okay. I'll go back. To it. Okay. Um, so the fourth message um, is found in chapter 2, verses 1 through 22, which is if you're looking at your Bible, that's actually the entire chapter. Uh, so we'll read through it once, and then I'll uh, do on the different parts. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your ear to understanding... Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in his pervasiveness, in the pervasiveness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and, whose are, and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the <coughs> companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, and her past to the departed, none who go to her come back, nor do they regain the path of life. So you will walk in the way of the good, and keep to the path of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those who with integrity <coughs> will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be uh, rooted out of it. Okay, so the, so the fourth message here is simply put, seek wisdom. But it gets more complicated than that. First off, we see in, in, in verses 1 through 5 the idea of seek wisdom with a whole heart. Really uh, desire greatly. Look at the things that he says about it. Make your ear attentive to wisdom. To make your ear attentive to wisdom, that means you're just looking for it. You, you're, just, you're just trying to listen to it anywhere you can. Um, inclining your heart to understanding. Um, in, in Hebrew th thought, the heart is kind of like your, your innermost being. Um, so to incline your heart is to, to incline 
your, your desires, your, 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 your innermost parts are inclined to understanding. You're greatly desiring this with all of you. He compares it to, in verse 4, seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasure. So with this idea that that seek it like it is something of great worth. Well, well, if there were, if I told you there's a box of ancient gold that's worth millions of dollars at the end of that road, all you have to do is go get it. You go run after it, right? That's yeah. the kind of the idea here. Right. Something that you're seeking after. Um, so seek wisdom, simply put, verses one through five, um, and in verses six through eight, we we find a little bit of a of a conundrum. I'll start in verse five actually. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Um, wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. So something that, that you have to note, notice from this is he says seek after wisdom. And then he says as you seek after wisdom, God will answer you. Not wisdom will answer you. As you're seeking after wisdom... God will answer you. Well, that seems like a little bit of a weird thing. We're not seeking after God here. We're seeking after wisdom. Well, he clarifies in verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. In other words, wisdom is inseparable from God. So then you go down to verse 6 and it says this, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity. Now, notice the wording that he chose there. A shield, right? Being something that protects someone, right? Notice the words that, that he compares wisdom to. And then in verse 8, guarding the path of justice and watching over the way of his saints. So, and then in ver the next section um, is after, you know, um, you're seeking wisdom. And in, in that seeking, uh, God, God answers you. And what's the result of that? You live morally, which is where verses 9 through 11 pick up. Then you will understand. What does he mean then? After you've sought in the Lord and the Lord, has, the Lord has answered you, right? Verse 5, then you will understand the fear, of the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Once you've found the knowledge of God, then you will understand righteousness and justice. You'll understand the basis of morality. You, Your lifestyle will change from the things that God shows you. It's like this. How many of you... Believe that. What's a good question? How many of you believe that friends are good to have? Yeah. So you believe that in your heart, right? And so what? From that, you've gotten friends in your life, right? Mm -hmm. See, what I mean, why? Because the things that we believe, inevitably, we carry out. If we really do believe that that there is a God, we will eventually want to know that God. And if we really do know that God, will eventually start to realize the things that we're doing that don't really match up. See what I mean? I'm not saying, I'm not exempting the Holy Spirit from this process. I'm just saying, eventually, throughout the process of, of knowing God, your life ch is changed. Why? Because if you believe something, your life will mirror that. Eventually. Verses 9 through 11, Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity every good path. For wisdom, basically what he's saying here is you will understand how to conduct yourself wisely. You know, I don't have to be told not to co-sign on a loan. I have considered it. God has shown me what, what a wise handling of your money is and how it, how it is to be free from financial burden. And so I don't co-sign loans. I don't have to go ask my dad, should I do this? Because God's already shown me in his word things that I believe, and so as a result, it has affected how I live. I found righteousness and justice. I found every good path. Hey, this isn't a good thing for me to do, and so I didn't do it. <laughs> See what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, once again, he's not talking about one and done. It's not like, oh, you found it, so you're now perfectly wise. There's no such thing as a perfectly wise person. <laughs> In each of us, there's an element of wisdom and an element of fool. Remember what the question of the week was with, with the two characters that are contrasted throughout Proverbs? Uh-huh. If you go through Proverbs and look at all the things that the foolish person does, you're going to eventually find something that you do that he does also. Eventually. Does that mean you're a fool? No, it means that you act like a fool in that area. Everybody has an element of foolishness to them and an element of wisdom to them. The, po the point is that we're seeking after wisdom, right? So, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. 
Wisdom will come into your heart, knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Verse 11, discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you. Discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you. Hey, this isn't a good idea for me to do. <laughs> I should probably go to work tomorrow unless I'm going to get fired. See what I mean? Discretion will guard you. And then, oh, in that wisdom, I've decided not to get do something that's going to get me fired from work. Now I have money to pay to pay my rent. See? Discretion will guard you. Hey, that's not a good idea. <laughs> so, um, And then also, if you notice, so he said, seek after wisdom. God answers you because God, wisdom is from God. And then he said, you know, okay, so your life is going to change. You're, you're going to live morally as you, as you seek after after um, God, wisdom and thereby God. And then he says, or he notes here that he equates the two of growing with God is the same as growing in morality and growing in wisdom. The things, they're inseparable. So in other words, if somebody claims to be – let me say this in a simpler version because I think that I said it a little bit confusing. If somebody claims to be seeking after God, if somebody claims to, to know God and to walk with him, but they're living immorally, we know that they're liars, right? Not just because First John tells us that, but also because Proverbs just shows that, right? Because you can't possibly be growing in a relationship with God and be living immorally. See what I mean? Well, what's, what's living immorally? Living yeah. Example of living immorally. Just uh, living with someone and having sex with them instead of marrying them. Okay, there's a good example. Anything else? Cool. Gambling every weekend? <laughs> yeah, I would say that improper use of funds is probably a bad idea. <laughs> Any other ideas? Okay. Alright. You guys are kind of getting, getting the ideas. Lying about things to get ahead yeah mm -hmm. cheating that kind of stuff absolutely absolutely so as we grow grow in relationship with god and we grow in morality there should be also where we're growing in wisdom too if we're doing the same stupid same things over and over again and refuse to be taught hardness of heart isn't that far away and i'll just go ahead and leave that there um but i will say this god will intentionally bring by and bring things by to encourage you to grow in wisdom and Proverbs says that the fool hardens hardens himself, and that he will soon be broken, and that without beyond repair. We'll talk about that more later. But if you harden yourself, and God keeps trying to bring things by to to make you wiser, you're eventually gonna gonna break. So, um, but we'll get to that later. And then also, as an added benefit of not just living morality, living morally though, you also avoid the, avoid traps and snares. Look in verse twelve, um, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, delivering you from that way. Verse thirteen, who forsake the path of right of brightness to walk in the ways of darkness, so they they don't do the right things, they don't walk a good way. Verse fourteen, who rejoices in doing evil and delights in the perverseness of evil, so. You're not going to think. You're not going to see the world like they do. You're not going to think like they do. God's going to change the way you think. This is what Paul talks about in Romans 12 when he says, Let your minds be renewed. So verse 15, Men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. <clears throat> so now he's, he's, he's said the evil man part. And now he's going to go a little bit more in verse 16 um, <laughs> to talk about the evil woman. Woman. <laughs> um, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman. Well, who's the forbidden woman? It says in the next ver in the next line there, the adulteress with her smooth words. Now, if you notice, he's implying the man by using the woman as an example. Okay, let me let me show you what I mean. Who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of, of her God? Well, if she forgets the covenant of her God and she's cheating on her husband and you are partaking of that. That makes you an equal transgressor, but he doesn't say that there, does he? It's called a warning without actually saying you. Actually, the Bible does this a lot. Uh, for instance, do you know how many times the Bible talks about God without even mentioning him? In the Beatitudes, Jesus Jesus says, um, uh, be a peacemaker, you know, you know, do this, and you will be rewarded. Rewarded by who? By God. It's an implied meaning. I'll watch it. I'll, I'll turn there right now and I'll read it to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. 
You don't have to go there if you don't want to. But you can if you want to. Whatever. Right there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comforted by who? <coughs> Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Okay, who is going to, who's going to give it to them? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. See, in Greek, you can do this fairly easy, where you're implying something without actually specifically stating it. He's stating that God's the one doing this action. But he doesn't say anywhere in the Beatitudes, God will do this. God will make you an inheritor. See what I mean? And it's kind of the same thing with Proverbs here. He's talking about this, this immoral woman who's an adulteress, but by doing it, he's implying and warning that if you partake with her, it'll make you an equal transgressor. Once again, you have to kind of read the word and kind of understand it. You know, you get you got to kind of pay attention to it. Um, <clears throat> verse 18, For her house sinks down to death, and her past to the departed. So if you join her, what's that going to mean for you? Right? Mm -hmm. See? Verse uh, 19, None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the past of life. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the path of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land, and the, uh, those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. So there's a few things. First, I want to go back to the beginning of chapter 2 and point this out. It says uh, in verse 1, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments with you, making your attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you call your, uh, out for... If you call for insight and raise your voice for understanding, verse 4, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, in this is the idea of kind of like, um, I've talked about this a little bit in the uh, um, discipleship class, the idea of an umbrella where God will protect you as you do these things, okay? The first thing uh, is that first part where he's talking about if you receive and treasure at my commandments with you. When you listen to your parents, God sets up a, a protection for you. But then also it goes more than that. When you seek the ways of wisdom and you're living that way, God, God protects you from things. Not just in the fact that you will make smarter decisions because you're not an idiot, but also in the way that God will bring by things to give you special protection. See, look at the way he says some of these things. The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. He's an umbrella of protection. Okay? He protects them from those things. Not he helps them to not make bad decisions that will get them in bad in bad situations, but he is a shield to those who walk in integrity. He divinely protects them and intervene, intervenes for those who seek him with seek him for wisdom. Does that make sense? As you seek God's way of life, he divinely protects you. Does that make sense? So in other words, if you don't seek God's ways and you do seek your own ways, God will give stumbling blocks and he will remove his blessing and you cannot say I am walking in God's will because you're not walking in God's way. Mm -hmm. So you can know that you're not walking in God's will. Bad things will come by. It'll seem almost like curses. As we seek foolishness, as we seek our own way, God will remove that protection. But for those who are called, the Christians, who, who submit, we submit our lives to him, what happens is he, is he guides our life. Proverbs says um, he guides their feet. You know, he, he's a, it's a, a part, Psalm says it's a light into their path. That's what he's talking about. God divinely gu uh, guides people who are submitted to him. See how that works? So, and then in verse 19, I wanted to point something out. It says, None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the path of life. And obviously he's talking about, you know, the eternal consequences of cheating. Obviously. But there's more so than that. Not just cheating with adultery. Cheating in terms of not keeping your word. And in Proverbs, it highlights that throughout the whole Bible. This is just one example of cheating. That was weird. Um, but then also, there's such a thing as a cheater mindset. You, you've heard me talk about the druggy mindset. There's the same idea for a cheater, uh, a cheater uh, mindset, and it's kind of this idea that you know I'm I'm not going to get caught. There's, it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? The, these different things that you lie to yourself, and it's a cheater mindset. And when he says this, none who go to her come back, nor do they regain the path of life. 
Of course, you can be saved after you've cheated. You repent, the Lord forgives you, you stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because tr to repent is to turn away from. Right. So if you truly repent, you're not still going to do it. Um, but none who go to her come back. He's saying, generally speaking, these people get in a mindset. Have you ever talked to people who justify why they cheated on their spouse or, or their girlfriends or etc.? Mm -hmm. They have this mindset. Once they've gone that way, they don't come back. You know what I mean? It's like druggies. Druggies can get saved and they can change. But generally speaking, those who go the way and go the way of drugs, they go down to death and you don't see them come back again. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. see what I mean? It, cha it changes how you think and how you see the world. And so what he's saying here is he's actually saying a, a very heavy statement. He, it sounds like he's just saying, "Oh, hey, don't sleep around because bad things are going to happen." But he's actually talking about temporary. And eternal consequences. He's talking about not just cheating with your spouse, but cheating in life. He's, he's see what I mean? He's talking about big things in a very small, concept, you know, context. So the thing is with Proverbs, after you read it, you have to stop and you have to actually just think about it. That's why I tell people don't try to read through Proverbs in a set amount of time. Just read a verse or two. Read a proverb and just think about it. Just think about it, because oftentimes there's a lot more going on in that one verse than you think is going on. And uh, so. Um, and then in verse 21, uh, he contrasts blessings and curses, temporary and eternal. Uh, for the upright will inhabit the land, and those who with integrity will remain in it. That's a blessing. But then here's the curse. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. So he contrasts the blessings and the curses, and the temporary uh, res um, outcome with the eternal outcome. Because, um, I mean, obviously, we see people who are immoral and unrighteous, but we see them still living and thriving, right? Yeah. Well, maybe here and now at this moment, mm -hmm. but you don't know what's coming their way. <laughs> right. Just because God's dealing with them with mercy doesn't mean that it will always be like that. Any questions on, on the fourth message? Well, and a lot of times you see, like, especially if they've, they've done this way their whole life, yeah. you know, they started out young doing it, and that, you see just a... A downward spiral as they get older yeah of the morally decayed and everything mm -hmm. and just yeah. you know and in fact I was thinking about this the other day it's actually worse and harder for our gen for this next generation coming up than it ever has been for people before and the reason why that is is because media is teaching them things mm -hmm. and when you accept something as a child you oftentimes won't question it when you're an adult you know? yeah. oftentimes not all the time but oftentimes and so they're believing things in their root of their being without realizing what they're doing. I'll give you an example. Media says love is love. Doesn't matter. Homosexual, whatever. Love is love. They hear this as a child, and so then they grow as an adult, and they don't question it. Right. But do you know how old we are before our reasoning fully forms in our brains? 25. 25 yeah. mm. So if you hear something when you're five and you accept it, 20 years later – it's a part of who you are. You don't even question it because yeah. the media told you that. Yeah. See what I mean? Mm. Are you guys kind of getting yeah. getting the gist of what I'm saying? So now yeah. these kids have to, without having, um, you know, the the same benefits that we really did as 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 kids. And you know, one of the things was was when I was growing up, church was more of a thing that people were expected to go to. Now, not not so much of a thing. You know what I mean? And we were even more lucky because we grew up in the church. You know, so we were like really lucky. You know, and and so those are some things that people just oh that fly. Sorry, that, that fly. I've been irritated at him all night, and I finally found him. But he's on the screen, and I can't smash him on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, um, but yeah, anyways. So the fifth message is found in in chapter three. Verses 1 through 35, which if you pay attention, is the whole thing there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to read it through a couple times. I'm just going to read it through once. So for that, I'm going to show you the sections as I go. Okay, the first section, um, well, first off, what is the fifth message? The fifth message is the characteristics of wisdom. These are the things that you'll see in the ways of wisdom, okay? Mm -hmm. With that being said, uh, it starts off with um, perseverance and love. My son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So this is more talking about the quality of life that you're going to have, right? Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Or Jesus said it like this. 
the two greatest command commandments is to love God and to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. What exactly what Proverbs just said? Mm -hmm. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the table of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God. Man. Mm -hmm. See, there it is again. Love God, love your neighbor. The, the, these entwining themes. And now this thing here is going to govern much of Proverbs, but it's not going to be referenced that often. Okay? Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. In verse 3, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so let your ways be known by your steadfast love and faithfulness. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, he goes on in verse 5. I'll show you here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. So, first off, that shows us when we're dealing with people, right, to not deal with them according to your own wisdom, but maybe according to love and faithfulness. But then also, it goes, and not only does it piggyback on that verse, but then it also has its own little message that it tells. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and you will make straight your paths. Okay? So now we see wisdom isn't having all the answers. If you think you're wise just because you, you have an answer for everything that somebody says, or you you have a, a two cents for every, every, something that everybody else is struggling with, that's not wisdom. <laughs> okay, you just said that. Trust the Lord with all your heart and gently not your understanding. In fact, later on, later on he says this. If you're an idiot and you close your mouth, people are just going to think that you're smart. So in other words, wise people don't have all the answers, and their mouth is not always open. Okay. Now that's going to be a main factor throughout. Mm -hmm. But verse 3 is something that, that, that's going to progress through the whole Proverbs, but he's not going to reference it that much. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Okay. In all these things, let not steadfast love uh, and faithfulness forsake you. Okay. Now, um, one more thing that I thought was interesting with verses 5 through 6, but everybody quotes this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, lean on your understanding. He's been talking about wisdom, right? Yeah. Knowing what to do. Having understanding and discernment. And then he says, don't lean on your own understanding. <laughs> Isn't that a conundrum, a paradox? <laughs> Isn't that just contradict what you just told me? I'm seeking wisdom so that I'll know what to do, and now you're telling me not to lean on my own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. So what Solomon is doing is he's combating something that people generally believe when they're reading things about wisdom. I will I will be smart, and then I will be able to make all these wise decisions. Um. So first he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understanding. But then in verse 6 he clarifies, in all your ways acknowledge him, and everything that you do, Make God the, the deciding factor of what you're doing and what you're not doing. Make him the basis of all that and seek him first. Trust the Lord with all your ways. And then he will guide your path. In other ways, he will show you which way to take. Wait, so I don't seek wisdom so that I can be the smartest person in the world? No, you seek wisdom so that God will show you what to do. Mm. See how that works? little confusing, isn't it? Because it yeah. sounds like a paradox, yeah. but Solomon's... Uh, interjection here, interjection. I can see you guys getting carried away because there's a lot of people who claim to be wise, but their mouths are just shooting off all the time. Uh -huh. And Proverbs says, in the abundance of words, there's much foolishness. In other words, if your mouth is open for long enough, you're going to say something stupid. <laughs> Which is why I encourage people, when people come to you with, the, with problems, do more listening than you do speaking. Because eventually, if you try and speak them and console them through their problems, eventually you're going to say something stupid. Mm -hmm. Listen for a second. Just listen. <laughs> I, I think another thing with Go that ahead. is when we, when we just lean on our understanding and think we're all that, pride takes yeah. root. Takes over. And when pride takes root, wisdom wanes. <laughs> Okay, so wisdom isn't having all the answers. Wisdom is persevering in love. Wisdom is making uh, decisions rooted in godliness. Verses 7 and through 10. Be not wise in your own eyes. This goes right hand in hand with verses 5 through 6, but it also is a standalone verse. To be wise in your own eyes is what, what Chuck just said. To be prideful. You think you've got all the answers. You're wise in your own eyes. You don't need other people. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. See, if we think we're wise in our own eyes, as pride sets into us, we grow a hardness of heart towards God. But he says the exact opposite thing. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but instead fear God. See, he's giving us answers 
to what? Because with wisdom, as we seek wisdom, we hit dead ends. Pride is one of them. Mm -hmm. Despair is another one. See what I mean? But as we face these dead ends in wisdom, he gives us ways to overcome those dead ends. Pride, for instance, is overcome by fearing the Lord. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and turn away from evil. Uh, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment, refreshment to your bones. You know what people do is they justify the stupid thing they're, they're going to do because I'm the exception to the rule. This is a bad thing. It's not a good idea for people to co-sign on a loan. But I'm financially mature enough that I can handle it. Yeah. See? They can't. But they can't. They're just stupid idiots. But me, I know what's up. You see what he just said there? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You know that thing's wrong for other people. Why would you believe it to be right for you? Because you've lost the fear of the Lord. Now, what's the fear of the Lord? First off, the fear of the Lord is depending on him before you make decisions. It's seeking him wholeheartedly. It's praying to him and fasting before him. It's, see, it's living his ways. If you're not living his ways, you can't possibly say that you're fearing him. Can you? You've lost the fear of the Lord and justified your evil. So instead, turn away from the evil, fear the Lord, and don't be wise in your own eyes. See how he says that? You have to really dig into Proverbs because it's not just a quick read. Um, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. I think that goes easy enough. It's a spiritual it's spiritual rejuvenation when you follow God's ways. Verses 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your pro uh, produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Once again, we have a contradictory statement. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth and you won't be lacking. Well, that doesn't make sense. If I'm honoring God with my wealth, I would have less, right? But then he says, no, you'll have enough. How does that work? Don't know. But something happens when we honor God with our lives that God, what did I just say? Divinely guides our paths. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it, but God divinely guides and blesses those who seek after him. I'm not saying everything's going to be hunky-dory and there's not going to be any problems. But God does guide you. Guide you. Okay? So, uh, then verse 10. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting uh, with wine. Really, there's a lot of stuff that I could say in these two verses. But one thing I do want to say is that this was part of the covenant that God made with Moses in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Remember that? Mm -hmm. This was part of that covenant that they made with Israel. So we, not being under that covenant anymore, are not going to, for instance, inherit the land. Okay, does that make sense? However, in fearing the Lord, we are we will also inherit blessings too. Does that make sense? So, uh, verses 11, uh, you will make mistakes, but learn from them. Verses 11 through 12, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Why do you just say this here? Because you're you're gonna fall into places of, of of not acting in love and faithfulness. You're you're going gonna go through places of acting foolishly with your money. You're gonna go through places places of thinking that you're the smartest person in the world. But don't despise the Lord's discipline, because when you go reach those places, God's gonna discipline you and guide you to Him. Okay? Or be weary of His reproof, for the Lord reproves Him whom He loves. What is the reason that you shouldn't lose hope in the midst of the things that God brings by to grow character in you? Because he loves you. As a father, the son, in whom he delights. Think of yourself, a parent who greatly desire, greatly loves their child. And so you, you tell them, no, hey, don't touch the stove. That's going to burn you. Right? You do it because you love them. Mm -hmm. No father who hates his son would tell him, don't touch the stove. Go ahead, touch it. I don't care. See what I mean? But that's what, that's what he compares God to. God is disciplining those who he loves. Mm -hmm. See that? And this is actually kind of a kind of an important thing because we received a word in, in, after worship one time a couple it was probably about a year ago now. <coughs> and basically it was talking about God's love for us. And somebody was just they were just overcome with, with, with feelings and they said, you know, wow, I, I just didn't know that God loved us like that. Well Proverbs just told us that God loves us like that. Yeah. See what I mean? But why? Because they, they weren't in the word. See what I mean? I'm not saying that God, when God speaks to us, we shouldn't be moved by by just his love. But I'm saying this is something that they never knew because they hadn't read. And God wants us to know that he loves them, loves us. Um, so learn from your mistakes. And that kind of leads us to, did I really do that? Huh. I left off the last part there, guys. Huh. Verses 13 through, through 35. Um, we haven't continued on the next one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Boy, I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> well, I thought there was something else in between. That's why I yeah. didn't say anything. Oh. Boy, I would have been sitting here stumbling over myself for a while, being like, well, what did I do? Where did I put that note? <laughs> okay. Um, so then in verses 13 through 18, we see that wisdom is greater than possessions. Now remember, this whole fifth message is what? Characteristics of wisdom. So one of the characteristics of wisdom is that it is greater than possessions. As you grow in wisdom, you see its benefit, and you don't you don't seek after the things of the world anymore. Okay. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and for her profit better than gold. Excuse me. So what did I just say? As you grow in wisdom, you, you appreciate it more. You don't seek after the material things so much. You, you seek after God. Well, isn't that what he just said there? For the gain from her is better than gain from silver. Then in verse 15, she is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire uh, can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. See, the wise person says, no, he's not going to make me happy. But the fool says in his heart, I greatly desire wealth, and I'm going to do anything I can to get it. Which leads us to two ultimate conclusions. They don't get it, and they're sad, because they think that it will give them happiness. They do get it, and they're sad, because they thought that it would give them, give them happiness. But the wise person says, ah, hold on. Hold on. My, my life is not in the pursuit of gold. This isn't going to make me happy. <laughs> See? That's what he just said. Right. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of, uh, of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She has a tree of life to those who, who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. So he goes on and on throughout Proverbs, showing the benefits of wisdom. And this is one of those discourses here. He just goes on and on about, about the different things. Uh, her ways are pleasantness. You'll have peace in seeking after wisdom. See what I mean? Thing after thing. And this last part here, those who hold fast are called blessed. In other words, blessings overtake those who follow God's ways. So, then in verse 19, 19 through 20, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, as he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke, in, uh, broke open, and the clouds dropped down the dew. Now, here we have something that doesn't even seem to fit at all. He talks about in verses 13 through 18 the benefits of wisdom, all these, you know, all these things. And then in verse 21 he says, "My son, don't lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion." So he goes on that, and then in the middle there's these two verses that just don't make sense. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth; by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the deeps broke open and the clouds drop, uh, drop down the dew. Um, but if you actually kind of listen to what he's saying, it it, it, it actually does make sense. And the first thing that he's saying is that God's ways are wise. The things that God does is wise. Everything that he does is wise. God does not act foolishly. Okay? So when he created, he created in wisdom. When he created, he created the world to be in order, to be a wise world. Now, I don't mean that there's wisdom in animals. I don't mean that, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he created with a purpose. You know, things things behave a certain way, right? Beavers, you know, cut up the trees and and then they use them for dams and then they live in them. Right? Uh, animals know to do certain things like breastfeed. You know, he, he set up the world with a certain with a certain order to it. And in the order there's wisdom, and he created it with wisdom, okay? Um and so when we receive wisdom, okay, it aligns us with God in his creation. In other words, God intended us for for us to live with wisely. Does that make sense? He intended for us to live wisely. There's one in the fridge, in the crisper, or there's one next to the refrigerator. Uh, there's warm or cold, whichever one you want. Um, but does that you guys kind of see what I'm saying there? Mm -hmm. the, the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. Well, he's just been talking about how you need to seek wisdom, and now he's saying that wisdom is the foundation of the very earth. By understand by understanding, he established the heavens. By his by his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. So we see here that receiving wisdom aligns us with God and his creation. It aligns us with what God intended for us. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so it, it doesn't seem like it adds into the middle of it, but it actually does. And then the, the last thing here is actually kind of important. This is called foreshadowing. It means saying something that is going to be fulfilled later. Okay, like for instance, when Joshua led the, led the people of Israel into the promised land, it foreshadowed how Jesus would lead Christians into heaven, right? 
is called foreshadowing. So here we have something foreshadowing that Solomon did not intend, was not intended in the original manuscripts, that God brought to fulfillment. Does that make sense? In other words, Solomon didn't fully understand, okay, but God did, and God guided his hands. Solomon was talking about the way that, that God acts in wisdom, and that when we submit to wisdom, we open ourselves up to God's way of life. Absolutely. That's what Solomon was talking about. But in Solomon's statements, God brought a foreshadowed event of Jesus. Now, what is, how does John 1 start up with? In the beginning was the Word. The word was God. Right. And it says this, and it says this also in Colossians. Jesus made everything and held it into order, right? Mm -hmm. By him, it holds together. So that would make him what? Divine wisdom. Uh -huh. See, Solomon did not intend that, but that's something that God revealed in the New Testament, right? The same as oftentimes the Holy Spirit is, is kind of masked in the Old Testament, and the New Testament reveals the Old Test uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit. That's the same kind of an idea here. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that? Okay, cool. Um, but then we see in verses 21 through 24... Uh, after this brief little inter, uh, what do you call it? Inter, not intervention. Uh, inter, interlude. Interlude. After this brief interlude about about God's ways or our wise, he goes in verse twenty one. My son, do not lose sight, uh, sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So, what are these that he's referring to? Not losing sight of sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. And then on through verse 23 and 24. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. So uh, we see here, obviously, that the wisdom benefits. I mean, pretty simple stuff here. A lot of this we talked about already in, in last week's lesson. Um, they will be life for your soul. And so basically, they'll affect how people see you. They'll affect how you act. They'll affect how you interact with other people, your relationships in life. Your foot will not stumble, so God will God will protect you, and also, um, you know, you'll you'll just you'll know God's ways. Um, pretty simple stuff there. In verse 25 through 26, God will guide you in wisdom. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Now, these two passages and two verses here are so important to the rest of Proverbs, and. In fact, I'm going to say it for the rest of the Bible that I have another slide completely dedicated to these two verses. So we're going to come back to them, okay? All that you really need to know here uh, that I want you to get in, the, in the, how, what he's talking about in, ver in, in the flow of his thought is that uh, God will guide you in the process of wisdom. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your uh, feet from stumbling. Um, and then... Uh, Verses 27 through 31. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason uh, when he has done you no harm. Now, see, if you notice, there's, there, there's a statement, but there's also principles that apply to other things. Verse 29, what does it say? Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. There's a bigger principle there of don't betray those who trust you, right? Verse uh, 31, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. Verse 32, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, uh, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. And I'm going to stop there because I only wanted to go to ver through verse 31. So he just said in verse 26, the Lord, the Lord will be your confidence and will keep you from your, uh, keep your foot from being caught. Now... In the very next verse, 27 all the way through 31, he's going to talk talk about things that the devil will use to get you caught. Because he said God's going to prevent you from being, from being caught. These are things that the devil's going to bring by to get your foot caught. The first is do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. The idea here is that if you have the ability to do good and you don't do it, that is sin for you. See what I mean? If I... Let's say Zach passes away, and Becky's not in the picture for whatever reason, and I have the ability to help Colt. But I don't help him, even though the Lord has oppressed it on my heart, and, I, and he's given me the means to. That is an evil thing for me to have done. Not because Colt wasn't my responsibility, but it was in my power to do that good thing, and I withheld it from Colt. See what I mean? 
And when you withhold that good thing, that is an evil thing. Look at this. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. You can't go out and help everybody in the world. Absolutely. You can pray for them. You can do. You can look for opportunities. But at, in the end, you can't help everybody. That's just a fact of life. You have limited means. You have limited resources. You have limited time. You can't. However, when something is in your power to do and you withhold yourself from doing it, that is an evil thing. See what I mean? Well, I have this employee that works really hard and I could give him away a raise. I'm not going to. See what I mean? I'd rather hoard the money for myself when I know that he has children. When I know that he has a house payment. When I know that he has kid, you know, a, a wife. When I know that he has these other commitments. See what I mean? Uh, then another thing that will catch you, not, so not just greed, but in verse 28, another thing that will catch you, um, do not say to your neighbor, go and come again, tomorrow we'll give it, when you have it with you. Basically, the, the idea here is withholding payment, withholding a borrowed good. When you have the ability to return it, when, to, when you have the ability to give it, do it. Verse 29, another thing that will catch you, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Obviously, you know, sometimes neighbors get annoying. They, they do things like put up fences on your part of the, you know, um, property, line. property line is that they do annoying things like that, right? But it says here, do not content. Uh, I'm sorry, do not plan evil against your neighbor. For, uh, verse 30. Another thing. And how will these things catch you? Well, they start in here, and they'll end in here, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Proverbs has told us? The things that get in the heart come out through our hands. Mm -hmm. Matthew says it again, just in case we didn't hear it. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. And out of the abundance of what the mouth speaks, the hands do. I mean, he doesn't say that, but he says it, he says it without saying it throughout the rest of Matthew. Um, do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. Here, here's an example of how we do verse 30. Do not contend with a man for no reason who has done you no harm. When we take up the offense of, some, of somebody else. Chuck mistreated Zach. Well, now I have hurt feelings to Chuck. When I, I'm a third-party person. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. He has done no wrong to me. But I'm contending with him. Why? Verse 31, do not envy a man of violence. Do not choose any of his ways. Don't desire don't desire their ways. And then we see in verses 32, the conclusion to all these things uh, about the characteristics of wisdom. God opposes foolishness. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord. God despises that way of life. But the upright are in his confidence, are in his close escort. Okay, the uh, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. I already talked about this before, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. See, uh, James says it like this. Um, crap, uh, about the... Ah, brain fart. Uh, in James he talks about... Humble yourself and the Lord will answer you. I forget how he says it. Um, it's in chapter 4 or 5. Ah! No way, that's not right. It's not in chapter five, 4 or 5. It's in the... 2 is where he talks about works. So I guess it must be like around 3, I would guess. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you keep looking and I'll keep looking. You grab a line and I'll grab a pole. Juggle. You grab a line, I'll grab a pole, friend. Not the submit yourself. Right there, yeah, right there. Submit yourself um, before that, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Basically what Proverbs just said, James reiterates. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, the wise will inherit honor. You know, that's funny because people always say, I'm just not good enough to, to go to church. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I don't fit in. or did it. That's exactly how God wants you to come. Mm -hmm. If you felt like you had it all together and you tried approaching God, you wouldn't, it wouldn't benefit you very much because God would scorn you as a scorner. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Because that's what he just said. Toward the scorners, he is scornful. But to the humble, to the humble, he gives favor. So when somebody tells you, oh, I don't fit in, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm just not good enough. Good. Good. And that's the heart you should see God with. <laughs> the wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Okay. 
and that has to do with their conduct. So now I want to go back and we'll end on this note. Um, verses 25 through 26 um, of chapter 3. This is such a foundation for not just Proverbs but for the rest of the Bible. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. This is one of those verses that is talking about so many different things that I can only emphasize a few of them. The first is anxiety and panic. Uh, do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked, okay? Af afraid of a sudden terror. Now, the thing about sudden terror is it can come on instigated or with no instigator. It's a sudden terror. It's not necessarily planned or unplanned. It's just something that comes on suddenly. For instance, let's say you're watching the news. You become greatly afraid. Let's say you're not watching the news and you become greatly afraid. A sudden terror. So it can be anxiety and panic. Um, but then also... Look here, do not be afraid of the sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. Don't be afraid of the consequences of a moral living. Why? Because if you're living wisely, why should you be afraid of that? Peter says it like this. You have no reason to fear authority if you're not doing anything wrong. Now, Peter was, was later falsely killed by the, by the government, okay, by the authority. So obviously there are exceptions to the rule. <laughs> However, he's saying generally speaking... If you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to be afraid. If you're not speeding, you don't have to be afraid of getting pulled over. If you're not talking behind the pastor's back, you don't have to be afraid of getting caught. <laughs> See what I mean? If you're not doing anything wrong, generally speaking, you have nothing to be afraid of. Um, and so so there, we have two things so far. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, which can be something like anxiety or panic, or it can be something that's related to like news or something like that, or, or of the ruin of the wicked, or the consequences of moral living, because you're not living immorally. Hopefully, if you're living wisely. Um, but then also, we'll read it again. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Here we have another thing that this implies also. Don't be afraid of death. Because the Lord will be your confidence in this process. Um, and then he gives his reason for why you shouldn't be afraid in verse 26. The Lord will be your confidence. Do you understand what he's saying there? The Lord will be the one who carries you. The, uh, you could say it like this, the Lord will be your strength. Uh, the Lord will be your uh, protector. The Lord will be the one who, who keeps you from falling. The Lord will be the one who, uh, see what I mean? Who, who uh, what did he just say? He, the Lord will be your confidence, okay? And will keep your foot from being caught. So the Lord will protect you. He will guide you. Come on. And he will be your reason of hope. You can hope in the midst of these different things. Why? Because of God. Because of God, who is my is your confidence and who is the one who keeps your foot from stumbling. So in all these things, whether it's something like anxiety and panic, or if it's something that that is more tangible, like you know the consequences of, of immoral living, or or something more immediate like death, you don't have to be afraid of these things because. <laughs> Of the Lord, who is who is the one who will protect you and guide you and be your reason of hope. He'll be the one who 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 will who will um how else to say it? The reason for why you're living like you are, and the reason that you know that this thing will not overtake you, whatever it is, uh, except for death. Death will overtake you, but you don't have to be afraid of that. <laughs> That's the joke. Tough crowd. Um, <laughs> so then, let's see. Um, really a, a great verse. And this one, I encourage you all to memorize this, regardless of what, what's going on in your life. This is just a great verse, that, that or two verses, I guess, um, because it, it relates to the whole of Proverbs, the whole of Proverbs and the whole of the Bible. Just really a great a great uh, thing. Were you going to take a picture? No, no, no. Okay. I'm going to look at the verses. And so the sixth, sixth message, which I thought we were ending on the fifth message, but I guess not. I'm a liar. Um, is <laughs> chapter 4, 1 through 13. And then there's a break, verses 20 through 27. Chapters, I mean, verses 14 through 19 are a different message. We'll get to those next week, I'm thinking. Um, but uh, it's the summary and the summation of the sixth message is that wisdom is a family treasure. It's something highly treasured that you should guard guard closely. Okay, so the first part of that in verse, verses one through nine: Hear, O sons, uh, O sons of fathers, instruction, uh, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your words 
hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. This is David talking to him. Okay? Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So the first thing we see here, or if you were, I, I hope you saw it, is that God will God will use people and situations to bring wisdom, mm -hmm. not just divinely entering our heads. Right. It will divinely enter our heads. However, God will also use other means. Remember, Solomon was given his wisdom directly from God, not from people, not from anything else. However, we see here that God also, on top of that wisdom, gave him additional wisdom through people. And one of those people was King David who said this. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? That makes sense? So we see that wisdom is a life pursuit of river with many tributaries. Now what I mean by that is think of wisdom as a river that God sets in your soul. It's flowing, right? You're learning, you're growing. But that river has many tributaries. If you know anything about geography, a tributary is a smaller stream that feeds the river, right? Yeah. It's a smaller stream of water that feeds a larger stream of water, right? So here we see that there are many uh, tributaries. The first one is, for instance, when I was a son with my father. So his father was one of those tributaries. Um, and well, that's good enough for that one. I don't with it already being close to to eight. I don't want to go real long. I know I know I'm tired. I imagine you guys are probably tired too. I know I wasn't the only one working today. <laughs> uh, um, and then we see in verses 10 through 13, Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the path of uprightness. When you walk. Your step will not be tempered, uh, hampered. Now, he's not saying, I have taught you all that there is to teach, as he later clarifies. What he's saying instead is that I, I've given you that basis. Okay, You can do with it whatever you want, but this is the basis I've given you. I've given you a wise basis. Think of it as when you grew up in a Christian household. You grew up knowing that Jesus was a thing. You grew up knowing, that, knowing God and that kind of thing, right? It's a basis. You still had to grow in your relationship with God. You still had to accept Jesus for yourself, but you had the basis. You know what I mean, it's the same thing here. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Uh, keep hold. Now remember, this is Solomon talking again, not David talking. So what David said ended in verse nine. This is now Solomon talking. <clears throat> Hear my son, accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you, Solomon. I have taught you the way of wisdom. Um, I have led you uh, in the path of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. Now, um, in this, we see that we see that Solomon's instruction is pretty clear. Get wisdom as early as you can so your quality of life may be better. See what he said there? Um, uh, that the years of your life may be many. Uh, I have taught you. I have led you. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. If you run, you will not stumble. Now, is he talking about physically running? No, he's not talking about physically running. The same as Paul is not talking about actually running a physical race, right? <laughs> he's talking about our spiritual walk, our mental maturity. Well, that's what Proverbs is talking about too, our spiritual walk, our mental maturity, right? So, um, so as you're seeking after the Lord, you, these things these things won't stop you. They won't they won't be a stumbling block for you. Um, and then hop down to verse 20, because remember, 14 through 19 is, is a separate message. Uh, 20 through 27, we'll finish up the whole thing here. My son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let them escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Uh, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the paths of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. We have another contradictory phrase here. I'll just get to that in just a second. First thing we see is that wisdom leads to heart. Wisdom leads to what's going on in your heart. The heart eventually <clears throat> comes out of the mouth. And the things that you're saying and believing eventually are, sh are shown with your life purpose. Look specifically at verse 26. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. This idea of, of, of pondering, the idea that you're living with a purpose. See what I mean? 
how do you live your life with a purpose where you know what you're doing? You know what you you know. It's not something people tell you. Something you know in your heart by seeking wisdom, which is eventually embedded into your heart, which comes out through your mouth. Your life is changed, and you live with the purpose. So what happens when you don't feel like you have a purpose in life? Seek wisdom. Seek wisdom, because wisdoms you're not going to find that 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 fulfillment by going from thing to thing, by hopping from job to job, by divorcing and remarrying, by sleeping around. By it's, you're not going to find it. It's not going to happen. So uh, then also I wanted to pick up, show a few a few other things there. Uh, my son, be attentive to my words and clean your ears. Um, not, okay, now notice in verse 21 how he says this: Let them not escape from your sight. Once you become wise, you can stop there. And what happens? Pastors talked about this hundred times. You're either growing or you're decline in, in decline with God. You, you're never plateauing. If you think that you're plateauing, it's because you're you're actually shrinking in the Lord, right? Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them in goal. Keep them in in, in sight. This is this is the thing that you're working towards. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So did you see how that escalated there? He was talking about the the words and the wisdom, keeping it near. And then in verse 22, sorry, at the end of verse 21, within your heart. So like I said, the wisdom goes into the heart. And then he says here in verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Flowing from us. Okay, well, this is exactly what I just said. And then in verse 24, put away from you crooked speech. Wisdom leads to the heart, which leads to the mouth, which is life purpose. That's what he just said. See how, see how that works? How do you keep how do you keep um, crooked speech and devious talk far from you? By seeking wisdom, which gets into your heart, which comes out through your mouth, and you live with purpose. Wisdom is gives life purpose. See, a lot of times we read through these things and we don't actually listen to what Solomon is saying. And then in verse 26, let your eyes look directly forward. Now, this is the contradictory thing that I was just saying. He says, don't don't, don't look around. But then in verse 26, it says, ponder your path. Yeah. Look directly ahead, ponder your path. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> and what he's saying <laughs> what he's saying is in verse 25, he says, let, uh, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Don't get sidetracked with other things. Keep wisdom in sight. Okay, but then he says this, verse 26, ponder the path of your feet. Make sure that the things that you're doing is just lining up with where I'm setting my gaze at. Because remember, wisdom is the thing that we're seeking after. So we're, we're looking at our feet. Now, is this leading to that? I want to grow in the Lord. I want to become more wise. Is sleeping around helping me reach that? No. Is living with, al with alcohol abuse helping me reach that? No. Ponder your feet. Ponder your path. See, so although it sounds like a contradictory, watch for these in Proverbs. Because oftentimes they'll say two things that are complete opposites. And you have to stop and say, wait, what? Because why? Because wisdom literature doesn't just give us a command. It says, stop what you're doing and think. Think for a second. Okay? So then it, the, the, it, ends, uh, it end, ends in verse 27 with, do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Once again, a contradictory statement, isn't it? Do not swerve to the right or to the left, but then turn away from evil. Because evil is the right or the left. <laughs> that what is ahead, as he just said in verse 25, let your eyes be fixed on, on wisdom, right? So then, swerving to the right or to the left would be going to evil. So what do you do if you have swerved to the right or the left? You've lost sight of wisdom. Turn your foot away from evil. Oh, well, okay. So you're saying that there's never a time in my life that I can say, I'm too old to learn. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. No matter what your say, a sta a status is, turn your feet towards wisdom. Mm. See what I mean? Once again, you have to you have to kind of get the whole thing here. Does everybody kind of understand that? Okay. If you don't if you didn't understand anything from tonight's lesson, please keep it in mind, and we'll get to it next week. I evidently included the seventh message too. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. We're not going to do that. <laughs> We're not going to do that. So uh, everybody, unless you want me to, I can do it in about five minutes if you want. Or I can just wait till next week. I don't care. Let's wait. Wait? Yeah. Okay. So then the question of the week. Don't look at the screen. Okay. The question of the week is, do you consider yourself wise? Hmm. What could you change to become more wise? It's a two-part question. 
And I want some genuine reflection. I want you to genuinely stop and think about yourself. Now, here's the thing. This sounds really arrogant. I think I'm wise. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, we tell ourselves, oh, I don't think that I'm wise, but we actually kind of do. You see what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to listen to what Chuck has to say because I'm smarter than him. See what I mean? Now, I'm not, I'm not, I don't claim that I'm wise, but I'm not even willing to listen to what Chuck had to say. So mm -hmm. I am wise in my own eyes, aren't I? Mm -hmm. So when you ask yourself this question, do you consider yourself wise? Be blatantly honest with yourself. Okay? Blatantly honest. Don't don't lie to yourself. Okay, this is you don't have to share what you come up what you discover throughout the week. You don't have to share it tomorrow next week, but I want you to ask yourself the question either way. Okay, and what could you change to become wise? Now we'll we'll probably have a group discussion on that. But any questions? No. Let's stop the recording.